carbon from the carbon dioxide to make the food or the sugars that the plant needs. So uh, what Dan Nassara did was developed a catalyst, a catalytic process that um, does the first step of um, photosynthesis, which is break down the water. So you can have a tiny little uh, photovoltaic cell that provides the electricity to run this little uh, catalytic process that breaks water into hydrogen and oxygen. You can collect the hydrogen and the oxygen um, as separately as, as fuel, um, hydroxy gas itself, right? So you can have the hydroxy gas uh, as the fuel, and hydroxy gas will run any internal combustion en engine if you change the timing, because the octane rating of hydroxy gas is so high that you can't explode it until um, it gets to the very top of the of the uh, cycle, you know, the piston coming up and compressing it. And so you have to adjust the timing, but that's the only thing that you have to do for uh, to be able to run any internal combustion engine, a diesel engine or a gasoline engine, or uh, hydroxy gas. So uh, Dan Nassara designed the house that uh, using the artificial leaf and solar panels or uh, vertical access windows to generate the electricity. So he has a house that powers itself and that uh, creates the fuel for the transportation. And again, you're energy independent. And his, uh, his main thing is let's, if we're going to meet the power requirements of the world, and he has all the statistics for this, he shows that the only way to do it is if everybody is generating their own uh, electricity and fuel. So it's absolutely what we have to do. One way or another, we have to create the situation in which we're in energy and food independent. And, he, you know, I, I in my plan for Liberty Village, I said, well, th this ain't exactly anything new because we got Liberty Villages stretched all across America. It was called Small Towns, Small Town America. And and we, uh, yes. it, we these small towns, and this is what Noah envisions too. He envisions a uh, structure so it looks, the the structures and everything look like, uh, you know, a, a small town America in America. And these uh, small towns in America were surrounded by farms, family farms, before the government and the Federal Reserve and the, oh, let's see, Ninth Plank on the Communist Manifesto, corporate farms became uh, standard here. And again, they, you know, yep. as I've told people, they don't, they go after the farmers first and just, uh, as, as a kind of an aside here, that's exactly what they did in the 30s. They took our, they yep. stole our number one cash crop, sent it to Russia, sent it to uh, Soviet Union, sent it to Red China. It's called hemp. We used to be able to pay our taxes with hemp. The back of a, two, right. uh, uh, <laughs> a, a, a 1914 $10 bill has a hemp field on it. Yep. And uh, by the way, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica was printed on hemp paper for almost a hundred years. No, absolutely. So, so all yeah. of a sudden that's illegal? Like you can't, you can't have that hemp anymore. Although 10,000 products are made out of it, somebody might smoke it. <laughs> God, <I'm mad. laughs> So that's what, that's what the whole uh, marijuana thing in the same time as uh, prohibition was all about. That's right. Couldn't, they, couldn't have they, you couldn't have you doing that moonshine and running your car on moonshine. You got to go buy the gasoline. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean alcohol is another fuel that works fine. You don't have to do anything to the engine to run it on alcohol. It doesn't have quite the amount of uh, uh, BTUs that uh, petroleum does, but there's no reason why you can't run your car on alcohol. It works really well. During the Second World War, when uh, fuel was really scarce, people even discovered how they could run their uh, internal combustion 
engines who are cars and trucks on uh, wood smoke on three <laughs> so so the, the, the amount of possibilities that we have for uh, developing real energy independence are legion I mean there, there's just so much that you could do if you if one were allowed to and that's from my point of view the, the real problem is the control of the media so nobody knows about it I mean, hardly anybody knows that Stan Myers developed the uh, uh, water as fuel uh, car uh, all the way to uh, being able to commercialize it. And uh, when he refused to sell out, both to the military and to investors, um, they ended up having to kill him because he was so close to uh, actually commercializing it. He was actually able to make um, para hydro hydroxy gas that you could pipe and use to for your stove and for heating and for anything, and it's all generated with the Tesla technology idea of uh, being able to split the water into hydroxy gas, into hydrogen and oxygen, using um, <coughs> the ambient energy in the atmosphere. Tesla actually uh, worked with Henry Ford to build a car, uh, the, an electric car, that ran out off of the um, Tesla uh, <coughs> generator that draws the power that converts the ambient energy in the atmosphere and in the earth into usable electricity. And uh, he drove that car to so got all the stuff that he needed to do and drove it down to Long Island and back to Detroit. Powered entirely with uh, Tesla technology. When uh, Tesla was, originally Tesla and uh, Edison were financed by J.P. Morgan, and uh, when Tesla explained to J.P. Morgan that he had uh, developed uh, power generation and transmission system that would deliver usable electricity anywhere in the world that it was needed, um, J.P. Morgan cut him off because uh, he didn't see how he would be able to meter it and how it would contribute to the control of the, of the masses. So all the technology, all of the ideas uh, about how to do this, they all exist. I mean, all, all the tests, you can buy the tests of patents. And any time anybody gets one of these things to a point where they could commercialize it, uh, and, well, they get bought out, or uh, if they won't sell out, they get threatened, and if the threats don't work and they carry on, then they end up having to kill them. There's a fellow guy in uh, Florida. Meyer. Did all of them. That was Meyer, wasn't what? it? Yeah, well, Bob Meyer, but people who used Bob Meyer's uh, technology, so he put a, he had a little golf cart with a little gasoline engine, and uh, so he put the uh, hydroxy gas generator into his little golf cart and left it at that, just so that if you want to, you can go down there and you can see what he did, but he's not trying to commercialize it because he values his life too much. <laughs> it's fascinating, all this stuff. It's just fascinating. And, of course, everything, at the end of the day, everything really depends on our being able to uh, to uh, create money that we need in order to be able to do all the things that we know would be good. And creating yeah. money is one of the, I mean, that's the really, really big secret because the money is valuable if people agree to accept it. And, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can use it for transactions, if you can use the money that you create for transactions because people are willing to accept it, right, then yeah. you can create an entirely uh, independent monetary system. And that's what we're trying to do with our credits. We're at the pilot project phase in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Now, one of the, uh, we had a conference call. And I was hoping that uh, an attorney for uh, that worked with the World Bank would be able to help us with her connections yeah, in banking uh, worldwide. But turned out uh, because I don't know whether it's because she was a lawyer. I don't know whether it was because she she found problems with the project 
Yes. Rather than offering any solutions for the financing, I I found that to be a real a real shame and a real lack of insight. Because I mean, it's very simple yeah. to me. If you're gener if you're able to generate your own power and you've got people working together, and the veterans are certainly trained to work as a team. And one of the biggest yeah. problems uh, I've got with the whole patriot movement is that trying to get them to work together is like trying to herd cats. <laughs> they just don't know. They don't understand that we need to do this together. We need to, and it's, you know, it ain't a matter of, you know, preferring one race, one color. I don't care what religion you are. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights takes care of that. So you can worship uh, anything you want, any way you want to. You want to hug a tree here, uh, you know, I'll, i got some tweezers here. We can pull the splinters out. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. unfortunately, this uh, this uh, lady lawyer didn't offer any solutions. Uh, well, you, you, you can't do this. You can't do this if you don't have the, if you don't have the, the, the funding in place. You don't have, no, you got to have the idea. <laughs> you got to have the concept first. And I believe that this whole thing, we can roll this into, a, we've got a 501c3 operations available to us. We can roll this into, a, we, we can provide and generate the financing just with the concept, just with this idea. The idea of being self-sufficient and having, I, one of the reasons that I planned on having veterans at, at my Liberty Villages was because they would be able to protect it from the raiders, from the thieves, from the government. Yeah, right. One of the things that uh, Karen Hood is, when we're talking when we're talking about well, was actually right about is that uh, um, getting putting the finance into place first. I mean, because uh, Noah and the Noah, Noah's project. Project Noah's Ark has the uh, the plan or the concept of what it wants to do. That's very well developed. So really, the next phase is putting the financing together. And what Karen was saying was absolutely true. It's how the control actually works. Until you can be, until you're able to finance something, you don't really have anything. And all she, I believe, all that she was saying was that. Um, she wasn't convinced, mostly because she hadn't heard the whole story. She wasn't convinced that he had enough of the financing uh, in place to really be able to go forward with it. So I, I wasn't, I didn't have so much trouble with um, the idea that you really need to get the financing in place. And what I really liked about Noah West is that he understands the needs of bank. And he, he absolutely, in order to overcome the problems of financing, you absolutely need a bank. And you can use the bank with the fractional reserve system and all the rest of it to accomplish what it is that you want because of the nature of money. There's absolutely no reason why a bank that isn't trying to uh, screw people and be, uh, you know, ridiculously profitable wouldn't be able to offer 60-year mortgages at 1%. As long as the bank can cover its costs, um, and it doesn't need to be profitable because it's owned by a not-for-profit and it has this mission, there's no reason why it couldn't be uh, set up to create a, uh, a possibility for a 60-year 1% mortgage, which would allow veterans to afford an 800 one of the uh, one of the things that I like about his approach and what he talks about, he points out that if we got one percent interest, it's a non-profit bank. What he's envisioned is setting up a central bank for community, for the community, for that town, that county. And I, I yeah. highly encourage the, in Texas here, the uh, Texas State Militia is being formed county by county under the sheriff, legal law enforcement. Right. So I, I Do you remember the, Yes, go ahead. 
Do you remember the Guardians of the Free Republic? No, I don't remember. Uh, that, that was a movement to uh, create a, 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 a constitution, a common law constitutional basis for uh, reestablishing the original republic. And uh, that was the major, major piece of what they uh, of what they wanted to do to really reclaim common law, because that's that's how the whole banking scam is able to work. The banking scam works by uh, changing common law so that things that make common sense um, don't prevail anymore. I don't know if you know about the Uniform Commercial Code and how, yes. that, uh, le how that legalized banking got the, got the bankers out of the bind that they were, were in that um, common law had uh, created. The, the, the vestiges of common law are, are the things that are put into place with the um, chain of title and the transactions for uh, financing home buying and mortgages. So the problem that we had with the, um, <clears throat> the meltdown, you know, the financial crisis in 2007, 8, 9, was all about securitizing, creating uh, a securitized a, a security instrument like a stock um, out of mortgages. And MERS, which was the uh, organization that the bankers set up, to overcome the problems of the chain of, of China um, is what allowed all that to happen. And then commercial law is need in order to uh, back that up and say, look, all of the centuries and centuries of common law that protects people from the rapaciousness of the banks um, is actually, can actually be argued to be legal. You know what I'm talking about, or is that yes, kind of not yes. explained it well enough? No, it's, yeah. uh, it, it's uh, you know, they have used uh, these regulations and they are uh, lawyers to weave this, so it's almost not, it, it's almost too difficult for the average person to understand. And uh, that's what they're hiding. This whole derivative yeah, thing, this whole derivative thing, oh, they're yeah. switching, uh, they're, they're shifting your mortgage, using that as collateral. Shifting that over to somebody that has no reason to, but you don't even know about. Yeah, right, and that's all contrary to the common law, which was, and which had all those built-in, uh, built-in protections. I mean, just the idea of paying interest to a banker that's creating the money on the basis of your credit worthiness. I mean, the bank creates the money on the basis of your credit worthiness. And then you pay tribute to them for, for absolutely no good reason. Any, any business should be able to, uh, it, it, the basis for its business should be the value that it, it, it provides for its customers. Banks should be able to charge a fee, right? There uh, it should be a professional organization, and they charge a fee for managing uh, the monetization of your credit. And interest shouldn't be part of it. And as, as long as interest is part of the, of the monetary system, which it is, all our money is created as a debt to banks, right? An interest bearing debt to banks. So there's never enough money to uh, pay the principal and the interest. Why? Because the bank only creates the principal, but you owe the principal and the interest, and the interest amounts to more than the principal if you're talking about a 20 or 30 year mortgage. So the financial system is creating an impossibility. It's a common law impossible contract. And when people were able to prove this in court, they had their mortgages dismissed. So they had to go to commercial law, which says the contract is sacrosanct. And it doesn't matter whether it's an impossible contract or not, you sign. <laughs> So our situation is such that we're, we're in this amazing uh, scam, banking scam, where the people who receive more interest from banks than they pay the banks is like 1%. And so everybody who's paying interest to banks 
and it's automatically transferring the wealth that the money represents, right? Because the money just represents the wealth. It isn't the wealth itself, right? It's transferring the wealth from the vast majority of it, from the 99% to the 1%, automatically, every day, ongoing. It's a... Uh People are starting to wake up to this somehow. This this just ain't right. I mean, our our Constitution provides for us to issue our own money. But uh, in this article that I'm working on, I talked about Kennedy and Executive Order 11110, which uh, would have severely cut into the profits and control of the New York banking establishment. And he, he was assassinated just five months later. Yep. And the first thing that Johnson did was recall that money. He recalled that money on the plane going back to Washington. And, of course, then... Uh, what's that? Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then he went on to kill... Fifty-eight thousand of my of my age group over there in Vietnam, yep. and even that's not valid because they they kill more more of them kill themselves when they got home than were killed there. So this is what yep. I like about the door, this Operation Noah's Ark, this Operation Green Fire. This uh. This will reward the veterans. This will, and, and the veterans do have the ability to turn this around. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, Save America Foundation dot com talks about the militia mobilization across the country. They got this to say, and let me share this with you. Yeah. We are American patriots, and we are dedicated to the self-sufficient, self-reliant. American off-the-grid lifestyle. Join us. Now, this is exactly what Noah is creating here. This is exactly mm -hmm. what this Operation Green Fire is. And they go on to say, the American people are definitely facing some intensely uncertain times. We have a history of being a resilient and resourceful people. However, as of the last 50 years, We've not been as resilient or as resourceful as we, the people, could be or should be. We, the administration, dedicate this group to the spirit of we, the people, the pioneer, self-reliant, self-sufficient mindset that made our nation the greatest nation and the greatest people in the history of the world, of the earth. Now, I've t I said both of these officers reflect the growing awareness in our military and our veterans that I've discussed in this article. I felt the, I had the uh, answer to my plan for the restoration of the self-sufficient family farm that's discussed in uh, www.libertyvillages.org. They go on to say, okay. to those of us who honor and regard this spirit of the American people and our health heritage, we welcome you. In times of financial collapse, we will survive and we will thrive. During uh, times of political uncertainty, we will survive and we will thrive. When we face the worst of times and difficulties that try the souls of the bravest men and women, we will survive and we still thrive. In the times of the worst local or national disaster, be they man-made or of natural origin, we will survive and we will thrive. We are the American people. We are mindful of our past and our pioneering self-reliant spirit. We are mindful of the need and the task of becoming fully and completely self-sufficient and being that example to all Americans who are and what all Americans should be. We, we the American patriots, we are American patriots, and we are dedicated to self-sufficient, self-reliant American off the grill lifestyle and following that I've got the whole uh, that is kind of the end of my article there but then I've got the whole introduction to Operation Green Fire the it's a veterans po program top to bottom and when the first phase is completed over the next 10 years it'll mean virtually 100% post-military employment of all our 9-11 veterans 
In some of the nation's most challenging and high-paying careers, in addition, we are making one million of the most advanced homes in the world, a green fire super home, available only to our veterans and their families and our wounded war war warriors, with a mortgage co-signed and one and 100% guaranteed for life by the veteran-run non-profit uh, Noah's Ark Global Foundation. Okay. And the thing that uh, Karen Hoodis was talking about was that until you actually have the financing for the uh, initial phase of the whole thing in place, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to do it. I mean, where are the veterans going to live while they're building the house? Where, what's their income going to be? Where, how, are the, how's all, how are all the details of this going to work? And uh, so part of the idea that uh, Larry West had was to create a bank. And creating the bank is the key to the whole thing because banks create money on the basis of the credit, credit worthiness, and if they can put to, if the bank that uh, NOAA creates is, or charters, or buys, or however he ends up doing it, if that bank is um, dedicated to the project, then there are all kinds of things that it will be able to do, uh, as long as it can stay within the banking uh, <clears throat> regulations, which isn't that hard to do, um, it'll be able to fund the whole thing. So I sort of didn't disagree with uh, with Karen about how important that is, because that's how everything is controlled. Everything is controlled by whether or not you can get the money for it. If you can't get the money for it, it's unrealistic. And the whole Green Fire project is unrealistic unless you can figure out exactly where you're going to get the money for it. And I understand that Noah is very aware of that, and that's what he's working on. So uh, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I, I feel that uh, the, the plan that I came up with, I had five acres. Noah's got 400. And uh, we've got people. Oh, it was, that, was it 600? Okay, sorry. The uh, the uh, veterans we got, the people we got, the people in America here, if they understand that there's a better way, then all we have to do is cut off the support for the federal government for the uh, this this bogus banking operation that is draining America. We can take back the states, and we can do it county by county. And the, the plan that right, I had... Or we, veteran by veteran. Veteran by veteran, yes, sir. And yeah, yeah. We, could, we can buy we can buy a, a, a TP for about 5000 bucks that'll house a half a dozen veterans comfortably. One of, one of, our, one of the people yeah. that were on the calls, he's up in my chat room right now, David Sneakus, he says, I lived in a teepee up in Alaska. Right. And, and it was... Especially if you're going to start in the South. You know? Absolutely. I think the, the level of ingenuity that's uh, available once you're, once you're out of the uh, mindset that you can't do anything is just incredible. I mean, it's just amazing what we would be able to do once we've got the... Uh, the sense that uh, we really can do something. And that's what we need. Well, I had we five acres. To build that thing. I had five acres in, uh, in the middle of New Mexico, about 10 miles from uh, the Trinity site. No radioactivity there. So that's a little bit more bullshit. The, uh, but uh, I figured if somebody's driving down a highway and they see ten teepees set up glowing brightly on the horizon and, uh, and, and there's a vacancy sign and a sign that says <laughs> hot coffee I think people would pull in there to just to see what it would say. I figured I could generate $500 a night from ten teepees uh -huh. and in one of those teepees okay. we have the uh, I would house the veterans that would work in return for room and board, 
and we have uh, we set up a gift shop and we set up a, and and we start educating people I mean basically that's what it is that's what I did in the middle of with just an old uh, Oh, I, I bought the old post office in Bingham. I had the north half of Bingham, Bingham New Mexico. The rock shop had the south side. And, uh -huh. and it, I could have generated $500 a day. The the property cost me 50000 I ended up selling it to somebody that was supposed to help develop it for 150000 And if they had allowed me to put that money back into it and develop it, it would have been worth a quarter million or half a million overnight okay. overnight and I think we can do by if we set this up like that and use these yep. uh, these these little homemade Indian villages to uh, to go ahead and uh, and we can generate our own income for this project and turn around and have people buy in and let them raise your own finance and to buy these these homes that are totally self-sufficient this is the most this is the most incredible project and the most incredible thing I think we can offer the American people and it's built by veterans yeah. it's built by veterans and it benefits the veterans and here it is we can build you that we've got the technology we got the patents we got the ability to do yeah. this and the veterans aren't going to let the uh, Federal stormtroopers roll in and take it away from you. And by the way, there's also there's also up on YouTube. There's quite a bit of uh, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, videos up on YouTube about the people in Australia that have built magnetic generators. Now you can take a magnetic generator. That uh, you could buy in Australia, they won't allow it into this country. They won't allow a. They won't allow a. Uh, a. Uh, they won't allow you to have a patent on it. And but you can set a magnetic generator up that you could have bought in Australia in your garage, and not even have to worry about solar. Not even have to worry about wind. But they call it a perpetual yep. motion machine in the patent office, so they don't want you having this. And so the technology is there, folks. It is there. Now it's just a matter of uh, how do we put this together. We can put it together if you stop financing the banks, if you stop fi financing this uh, Zog. What I, I think they were right about that 25 years ago, calling this a Zionist occupied government. And remember, Israel was formed by the Balfour Declaration, which was sponsored by the Rothschilds. And the Rothschilds considered Israel as their own personal little colony. I call it a safe country. It's like a safe house. It's where after you get caught ripping off. Uh, population. This is where you can go hide. Right. Well, what they what they really needed was their own country because they needed a secret. You know, they needed a CIA type operation, and that's what they got with Israel. It's a, a lot of people in it, there are a lot of people in Israel who are vaguely aware of this, but the uh, the <laughs> myth about um, anti-Semitism. I mean, there's, there's hardly anybody in the, in the truth movement that's actually anti-Semitic. But that's what they use all the time. And because if you've, if you've gotten yourself to a place where you can find out all this stuff, all the hidden history about how Israel was created and the role of the Rothschilds and all of that, you're not going to be prejudiced. You're going to be aware of uh, you know, where, where the control is. And people, when they start down the rabbit hole, and a lot of people, um, you know, wake up, realize that things aren't the way they are, and then they're only willing to go so far, you know, and then they're willing to go this far and see this much of, of what's uh, really been going on. And lots of people get stuck, and they, you know, they can't uh, keep their minds open and see. But if we just talk about this 
solutions, if we just talk about uh, the way in which it could really be different based on the things that we can do, then that piece doesn't matter so much. So I, I always find it a little bit, um, I mean, talking to you about the, uh, the lost child is fine, but trying to overcome the, the uh, amazing power that this anti-Semitic thing has is, from my point of view, kind of counterproductive. I mean, I'm always willing to let it, to, to talk about it with anybody who's actually willing to entertain it and isn't going to accuse me of being anti-Semitic, but I'm not willing to talk about it with people who haven't gotten that level of independence in their thinking. Well, you know, years ago, I read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and of course, this is probably why I'm blocked in libraries, why I'm blocked in uh, major companies, why you can't go to Office Depot and pull up the Free American. Uh, because I've got links to the protocols that the elders design. And if you ever say that around a Rothschild agent, ADL or Southern Poverty Law agent, uh, you know, they start screaming, well, don't you know that's a forgery? That's a forgery. Well, what's a forgery? What's a forgery? <laughs> well, oh, yeah, that's... Doesn't matter. Yeah, that's I mean, it. Whoever it, wrote it. It doesn't matter. Is it a forgery or isn't it? I don't care if it's a forgery. Is what it's saying them to. So if you read the protocols, right, is this what actually happens? Well, yeah, sure it is. Look at this. They, they go into everything, everything that they need to do. And so the, the planks of the Communist Manifesto, for example, is a subset of what's in the protocols. <laughs> it's just a roadmap to uh, how to run the world if you have the money. And then the key, of course, is that as Mayor Amschel Rothschild said, uh, permit me to issue the currency of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. And that that's just a blatant admission of, uh, of where they're at. We don't care who makes the laws. We get to issue the money. You know, we that's control right. everything. We control the economy to the extent that we can manipulate people. We can pump them up and we can thrash them. And we can make them afraid, very afraid, and we can liberalize uh, that with making the economy boom because they have control of money and uh, get the things that we want, like the atom bomb, like all the technology. Um, there's a fellow called Michael Sarian. And Michael Sarian goes into uh, how all of this came about. I mean, he goes all the way back to Atlantis and earlier, and not quite as far back as Michael Pellinger does, but he goes really far back. And he demonstrates that the uh, alien interveners, the people who genetically uh, manipulated humans to human beings, uh, not that they were over not that they were able to overcome our divine nature. That's a really important piece that uh, all of these genuine researchers are aware of. The genetic manipulation was not able to overcome our uh, divine nature, but, or the, the violet ray or the spark or the, you know, that whole piece. But what they were able to uh, do was to dumb us down enough so that they would be able to manipulate us. So this conspiracy of uh, world domination goes way, way back. But they can't ever accomplish anything unless the people have the freedom and the autonomy to really develop the, uh, the society and the economy uh, that provides all of the technology that they're trying to recreate. So that's what happens. You know, they get what they want, and then they crash the economy. Everybody's living in fear, and they're more, more manipulable. Then uh, we need something else to, to come along for the next piece of it. So you pump up the economy, and you let all of those things happen, and then you crash it again. And that's how they, how they manipulate us. That's how. That's why having the money power is so much more important than having the legislative or the, the lawmaking power, because you can get the lawmakers to do whatever it is you want if you have enough money. 
in the banking families is actually 13 of them. It isn't just the Rothschilds. It's a wonderful book by uh, Springmeyer and uh, Galen Ross, the two of them. Springmeyer is the bloodlines of the Illuminati, and um, Galen Ross is who's who of the elite. Uh, you know, where he goes, he goes into how these interlocking families, which interbreed, maintain their power worldwide. You know, they create all of the things that go on. They, sure. they manipulate things so that they develop in a certain direction. They don't have absolute control. We know that. We're able, unless we go along with it, unless we act, unless the people acquiesce, right, they can't do it. They haven't been able to create a third world war because the people don't have it. You know, they, they tried they real hard with things. Syria and they're trying real hard with Iran. And as far as I know, Iran never did anything except kick our dictators out. Our established yeah, dictators right. out. And, That's right. That was people power. And by the way, and I'd like to get your opinion. The, anybody that thinks this is impossible, that, oh, I'm just one man. There's nothing I can do. Bullshit. This is right. what Iceland did. Iceland kicked these bankers out. They arrested the bankers, and they bailed out the people. The George okay. Bush, when he was walking out of the White House, he gave the bankers enough money, two trillion dollars, he gave them enough money to pay off every mortgage. If he had given that to the American people, we could have paid off the bankers, we could have paid off our mortgages, we could be sitting there free and clear. But they, but they did. They, they, they did. The mortgages, uh, Mortgages that are uh, non performing on the bank's balance sheet, right? That's what they did. They replaced that money, the non performing mortgages, with the money that the Federal Reserve created, and all those mortgages were paid off. In fact, way more than the foreclosed mortgages were paid off. It's just that we, because of the complexity of how the whole thing is arranged, it doesn't look like that. But that's actually what happened. Where'd that money go? If they put those trillions of dollars into the economy instead of just on the balance sheets of the banks, there would have been massive inflation. There's no inflation. There's still deflation. You know, we're still dealing with uh, the consequences of there not being enough money. The, the money supply, <clears throat> this is one of those interesting things about the existing system. Because the money is created, by the bank, all the money, whether it's the Federal Reserve creating it or the bank creating it as a loan. All of the money is created on the basis of the creditworthiness of the borrower. And what the bank does is takes the promissory note, not the mortgage, just the promissory note, and the promissory note is an asset of the bank. And because of banking regulations and the way that the whole thing is set up, the corresponding liability that the bank is able to write into your deposit account is the money. You follow that? I'll do it again. What happens is that the bank gets to treat the promissory note as an asset. So you sign the promissory notes. First thing you do at the closing, first thing you sign is the promissory note. Now the bank has an asset, and the corresponding liability for that asset is the money that they write into your account. So they've created the money on the basis of your credit worthiness, on the basis of your promise to go out there in the world and do all the things that are necessary to make that money that they put into your account valuable. Right? You're going to make that money valuable by the work that you do that allows you to earn it to, to pay it back. So interest on the, on the loan is pure tribute to the true uh, ruler to the true sovereign, to the true uh, uh, originator of the whole society, which is the banks, how they create money, although bankers don't understand this. Anyway, the consequence is that they've only created the money for the principal of the loan. And as you make principal payments by the same token, by the same idea that created the money, that money is extinguished. 
So in order to have a permanent water supply, there has to be, in the way that the, in the logic of the system, in the way that it works, there has to be a loan, the, a principal, right, a principal amount that is never paid back, that's never extinguished. And that principal, that loan, has to be big enough to be the permanent money supply. And if you're following me, you'll know what that is. That is the federal debt. The federal debt never gets paid off, and it is the permanent money supply. You follow that? Yes, sir. Now, what what can we do here? This this bank, uh, somebody's supposed to be sending me, New Web is supposed to be sending me some documentation on how we can uh, how we can uh, form a bank. How can we can set that up? I mean, if if you can have right. a and and all you got if you're not being a greedy here and you're talking about a one percent interest loans to build houses, and the vet houses are being built by the veterans, it seems to me that we can put this whole system to work for us and for the right. people. Yes. You see, the, the difficulty that we're in is that uh, we are very desperate. I mean, they're, they're really losing their control, and they know it, and they, they watch it happen all the time. They can't make the things happen and the things that they've been planning for decades. I mean, they're 10, they're 10 15, 20 years over the time for the, uh, <clears throat> for, the, for the war. You know, they just haven't been able to get it. So, that's, by the way, that's been, that's been the planned. The, the big, John, uh, let me, excuse me for interrupting there, but yeah. that Third World War has been planned since the Civil War by Albert right. Pike, who said we were going to have three world wars, and the third one being with the Muslims. And frankly, I, you yeah, know, but, I don't care. I've told people, I don't care if you want to, the, the, you can't say anything about Israel, but you can certainly talk about those nasty old Muslims any time you want. And I've said, I don't care if you want to, if you want to get on your hands and knees, put your nose in the dirt, your ass up in the air, you know, pray to Mecca two or three times a, a, day, a, a day, I don't care. Doesn't bother me. I just don't expect me to get down on my knees with you. And I feel the same way. <laughs> I feel the same way about right. if you want to beat your head against that wailing wall, knock yourself out. I'll watch. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that, that's why, what I mean. One of the main things that happens when you start to discover all of this is that you realize how powerful the, uh, the religious sensibility is. So it's, on the one hand, it's really, really important to have a sense for your own divinity. So you need to, and in the way that you speak, you have a very uh, strong Christian uh, relationship to, to the Christ, right? Well, the, uh, the, you know, Jesus uh, told us, Jesus told us, you can do what I do and more. And I, uh, you know, my vision of Jesus is uh, chasing the money changers out of the temple with a whip. And I don't, uh, you know, I, the the whole concept of Jesus, a figure of a graven image of a man hanging on an instrument of torture, that doesn't appeal to my religious uh, sense. I don't think... Uh, you know, I, I just I think that's part of the propaganda because they want you to they want you to present Jesus as a fallen figure, and you know I know that uh, the two thousand year old blood of, of of Jesus had you know unique characteristics. It only had twenty four chromosomes, not forty six. Twenty three from his mother and one from God, I guess. And and uh, this was uh, discovered by Ron Wyatt years ago. Yeah, well, that's part of all the hidden science. I mean, that's the, the, the until we're until we're able. There's a wonderful book by um, <clears throat> by uh, David Wilcox called uh, "The Source Field Investigations," and then his current book, book is called "The Synchronicity Key." And he really documents all of the new uh, scientific uh, awareness that 
and I'm an unbeliever that an animal will explain the miracles that Jesus was able to perform and will describe the, <clears throat> why the test of technology is possible and all that. And it's all precise. But <clears throat> David Wilcox is getting it out of the <clears throat> out of the peer reviewed uh, journals that then the stuff doesn't go anywhere. <clears throat> but I want to get back to the bank. Okay. okay. Please. The problem that we're up against is that the FDIC and the Federal Reserve have basically decided there can't be any more new banks. You can't charter a new bank. There are plenty of banks that you could buy. So the challenge is to buy the bank, to buy a bank. And from what I understand from the West, there are possibilities of buying a local bank down in Florida where he wants where his original village. The first village that he's talking about, he already has the land for. That's the 40 acres. That's the house, the houses, the super homes surrounded by the 40 acre farm. And uh, <clears throat> if he, if, if the uh, financing that he has in place that's coming, right, is able to provide enough money to buy a bank, then the whole thing becomes totally realistic. And we'll he'll very likely be able to uh, provide the mortgages and get these get this thing going. But if he can't buy a bank, if he can't get a find a bank to buy and can't find the bankers who can get on board with this because of course bankers are trained not to think like this. Well, you know, the, the, the bankers have a really hard time with the whole non profit notion. Let me let me ask you They're this. Happy to lend to not for profits, but not to make the bank not for profits. Let me ask you this. What about what about BRICS? What about the BRICS countries? Brazil, India, right. Russia, well, Iran. What? I mean, what couldn't couldn't we couldn't we get financing from one of these overseas banks like like Iran? I mean, uh, you know, we hadn't declared war with them yet, so I believe we could borrow money from them, or we could get money from them. And if they knew we were working to stop our our military from attacking a bunch of brown people, I think they we might be able to get financing from them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Most of, I mean, all the entire financial system of the world is based on money and debt. So uh, even the BRIC countries, and I mean, one of the reasons that uh, China was able to develop its economy so quickly was that in China, the banks are publicly owned. The, the government runs the bank, and so they can create as much money as they want. And there are lots of examples of, in, uh, <coughs> in China of projects that didn't pan out. There's whole ghost, ghost cities in, in China that, that they built that never... Uh, you know, never really took off. But um, all the money is still dead, and that's the thing that we really need to overcome. So maybe that's what we should talk about for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, half hour, what, what money really is, and talk about the nature of money so that people have a sense that uh, creating money or creating a monetary system is a no-brainer. You need the community. You need the people to buy into it. But all they have to do is accept it. So let's say we issued a coupon. Let's say we have uh, a town. Let's let's say uh, Greenfield, because that's where we're doing it, right? So you get all the businesses together, the ones that are, have a progressive uh, uh, mentality, who who are owned, locally owned, by people who have a sense that they're serving their community, right? So the co-op, uh, a restaurant, um, <clears throat> a worker-owned cooperative doing alternative energy, you know, all those kinds of uh, businesses. And they get to get together and issue a coupon. And the coupon is good at any of those businesses. So that coupon, you know, let's say it's for a discount. Uh, we issue a coupon, it splits a 10% uh, discount, they, they can spend the coupon with any of the other businesses that accept the coupon, so it, it isn't, they're not actually 
people and having to give the um, the ten percent reduction uh, discount unless they uh, just keep it, unless they if they don't spend it again, right? If they just take the coupon, which is what usually happens, then they've given a ten percent discount. But if they then spend their ten percent discount coupon somewhere else, right? That's money. Now that's exactly that the way that's exactly the way Ithaca hours works, and well, uh, the uh, also there's uh, something else that I recommend uh, that you take a look at, and that's in Oklahoma they have the Oklahoma Food Co-op, and what they're doing there they've got to, they got the whole thing outlined. You join this co-op, and you get your food straight from the farmers, the organic farmers. They yeah. have to be organic farmers. They can't be uh, using this genetically modified crap that rats won't eat. Right. <laughs> here, here, have, have this. Uh, the rats yeah. won't eat it, but we can feed it to your kids. Yeah, right. Well, that's population. That's the eugenic uh, agenda. But anyway, so let's go back to the nature of the earth. Okay. The most important thing, the most important thing to understand is that regardless of what anybody thinks about it, the money only ever represents the real things, right? So there are real goods and services. The real goods and services are what's valuable. And in order to affect an exchange of value for value, you need something that abstracts it. That's the unit of value, right? So everything has price, and the price is expressed in terms of the unit of value, dollars and cents. And everybody knows what a dollar is worth, right? So now you can compare everything. And <clears throat> when you decide what to spend the things that you did that got you the money, right, or the things that you need that somebody else did, it's also represented by a price. You make the decision about what to do based on what will benefit you, what will be profitable for you, right? Yes. And the money is what allows that to happen. The unit of value is what you need in order to be able to price everything so that you can compare it all, uh, that we can compare everything. It's all commensurate because of the unit of value. And then we use something that we all agree to use because we have to. It's the law. It's a fiat of the law, right, that you have to use the money. The courts won't back you up if you try to pay with something other than money. You have to convert whatever it is that you want to use to pay into money, and then you can use the money as the means of payment. So the means of exchange or the means of payment is the actual device that you use. If it's a coin or it's a bill, or it's a bank account. And what's happened in the past century is that all of the money, except for maybe 2 3%, which is still cash, was all a payment system, an accounting system, administered by banks. You, can, in other words, you instruct the bank to transfer money from your account to the merchant's account or to somebody else. It's all an instruction. You swipe your card, whatever it is, debit card, credit card, doesn't matter, um, or you write a check, or whatever. Those are all instructions to the bank to transfer what you have to somebody else's account. And the other side of that transaction is you get the good or service from the person that you're transferring the money to. So it's an accounting system. There is absolutely no reason why we shouldn't, in a community of people that we can that, that can understand this, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be able to set up an accounting system so that we can have uh, the, the benefit of the unit of value. Let's just keep the dollars and cents. We can even pay people a, a, a compensation. We can create the money to pay people for inflation. So our currency doesn't inflate relative to the dollar. If we're going to use the dollar as the, as the unit of value, and then we can create our own payment system so that we're not dependent on the dollar, the Federal Reserve note, and the banking system that's based on it. 
as an entertainer. We can create our own entertainer. And that's your key. If you have your own bank, you can say all the transactions that happen between depositors and the bank are not done with the Federal Reserve dollar. They're done with our dollar. Now, what about the what about the uh, Sioux Indians, the banks up there in North Dakota? Now, North Dakota has uh, its own state bank, and the Sioux tribe has its bank. What about those? Is yeah. there something? Is some there some way we can work with them? Well, we won't be able to work with the Bank of North Dakota because it's um, very much integrated into the whole thing. The, the value of the Bank of North Dakota is that it makes all kinds of things that local banks wouldn't be able to do possible by fa um, by backing it. So the the Bank of North Dakota doesn't compete with the local banks. And North Dakota has more local independent banks than any other state per capita because of this. So they'll go into financing projects with the uh, with the local banks. And all the profits of the Bank of North Dakota go back into the state coffers. It's owned. I mean, the, actually, North Dakota is doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. That's actually how they set how they set it up. So the Bank of North Dakota has a North Dakota mission. If we were in North Dakota, we might get the Bank of North Dakota to fund us. But we won't be able to cooperate with them to do something in Florida. Whereas it might be possible, and I don't know enough about the Sioux Bank to know this, but it might be possible to uh, work with a, an Indian tribe in Florida to uh, buy a bank. I mean, there are all kinds of possibilities. And the key to buying the bank is that we're now integrated. We're integrated into the existing system, doing it differently. And that's the key. We absolutely need a bank in order to, because the, of the limitations of, of the size of the community that you can create, right? We won't be able to create a big enough community quick enough to be able to just use our currency. So we have to be able to um, convert our currency to federal money, and federal money to our currency, and that's what banks do. So we we have to have a bank in order to succeed with this, and Karen was right about getting, about it being more important to have the funding in place than anything else. That's what we're working on now. So. Well, it seems to me, the you know, my, I, I've, I've kind of made the statement that uh, when I decided to use teepees for my Liberty Villages, I said, you know, maybe the uh, the Indians really had it uh, had it more together than we are. We shouldn't, have, you know, we bought into the whole box houses type of uh, neighborhoods, and uh, the Indians were uh, a little bit more mobile, a little bit closer to the land. Right. Well, the Indians had a gift economy. And the gift economy was based on, at least, the, the, the most advanced version of this was the Iroquois Nation. And I'm sure you're aware of the contribution that the Iroquois Nation made to the idea of the uh, American Constitution with the separation of powers. Yes. But in, in the Iroquois Nation, they had a separation of powers that uh, Benjamin Franklin was particularly keen on. And that is that the leaders, the chiefs of the clan, of the tribe, and of the nation, were all chosen by the grandmothers, the wise women. The wise women choose the leaders, or the chiefs. And the chiefs serve as long as the wise women, the grandmothers, the postmenopausal women, are uh, in agreement, or in reasonable agreement, that they are noble, that they are serving the good of the people. And that's the basic separation of powers. So when Benjamin Franklin went to the Iroquois Nation powwow, and the chief, whose name I don't remember at the moment, um, he could speak a little English, and uh, 
Benjamin Franklin has learned a little Iroquois. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was amazed when this wave came into the camp, laden down with wampum. Wampum is shells. Purple is sometimes the value of white. And they make mementos out of them. Well, the, to commemorate all of the significant events. So it's a kind of a, a mnemonic, a way of remembering something. And the chief distributed the wampum to all the uh, lesser chiefs, the chiefs of the tribe who distributed it to the chiefs of the clans, so that there would be enough wampum for, and this happened every year, so that there would be enough wampum for the uh, people, the Indians, to make the mementos to um, uh, remember all the gifts that they give to each other in the course of the year, to commemorate the treaties that they make, to uh, remember the agreements that they make. So the Great Wall is a flag of uh, the Iroquois nation with the pine trees and the tree in the middle. Anyway, so what happened was that the Indian would run a knife from the colony, and the Indian would give, the, the colonist would give the Indian the knife, and the Indian would give the colonist a uh, string of wampum, a belt or a, a braid for your hair or a bracelet or uh, something. And from the Indian's point of view, he's acknowledging the gift of the knife. But from the colonist's point of view, he's being paid for the knife. So wampum, during early colonial times, up until the uh, 1730s and 40s, was uh, declared by the colonies as legal tender. You could pay your taxes with wampum. You could also make wampum. So they ended up setting up little factories that make wampum, you know, the sort of not understanding what money is, that the money only ever represents, it's only ever the standing, it's past the bargain, right? What I do for what you do, and the transmittal, the transaction, the the, uh, is represented by the money. So all the things that I did that I have the money for is represented in the money, and all the things that you need the money for is represented by the money of the good that you're giving me or the money that I'm giving you. So the money always has to be the right amount to represent the real goods and services. Anyway, my point was that the <coughs> Indians had a gift economy, and the gift economy used a memento, the, the wampum, so that you could remember the gift, so that there was a record of it all. So it's an accounting system, and that's all money is. Money is an accounting system. So uh, Benjamin Franklin had this idea, as he watched this happen, he said to himself, yeah, that's right, there always has to be enough money for all the transactions that the people want to make. <clears throat> and so he went around the country to a little, little pamphlet called The uh, Necessity of a Paper Currency. And he had all of the colonies create paper money. Pennsylvania did the best. They had the most successful uh, system, and they called it colonial script. And they created the colonial script as a uh, uh, mortgage on land or uh, against a, a, a plan for a business. And so there was, oh, you, you got a charter to uh, do, do your business from the state legislature, and you got the money to do it for the colonial script. So there was always enough colonial script, there was always enough money for all the transactions that the people wanted to make. The colonies went from the 1730s when colonial script became widespread and everybody was creating the colonial script. In the 30 years to the 1760s, the American economy grew to rival that of England. When Benjamin Franklin went to England in, the, uh, in 1757, 
he was amazed because there were there was a lot of poverty in London, and there were debtor prisons, and there was um, and there was all kinds of uh, uh, difficulties. And the people that he was uh, talking to, they explained to him that there was a population explosion and there wasn't enough work. And so uh, Benjamin Franklin said, and I'm going to find the quote here, there is abundance in the colonies and peace is reigning on every border. It is difficult and even impossible to find a happier and more prosperous nation on all the surface of the globe. Comfort prevails in every home. The people in general keep the highest moral standards and the education is widely spread. We have no courthouses in the colonies, and if we had some, there would be nobody to put in them, since there is in the colonies not a single unemployed person, neither beggars nor tramps. And then he says that in the colonies, this, this wasn't possible in England because they have the Bank of England and there's never enough money. The banks can't create enough money. So in the colonies, he says, we issue our own paper money. It is called colonial scrip. We issue it in proper proportion to make the goods pass easily from the producers to the consumers. In this manner, creating ourselves our own paper money, we control its purchasing power and have no interest to pay to anyone. You see, a legitimate government can both spend and lend money into circulation, while banks can only lend significant amounts of their promissory banknotes for they can neither give away nor spend but a tiny fraction of the money the people need. Thus, when your bankers here in England place money in circulation, there is always a debt principal to be returned and usury to be paid. The result is that you always have too little credit in circulation to give the workers full employment. You do not have too many workers. You have too little money in circulation. And that which circulates all bears the endless burn, burden of unpayable debt and usury. So then the Bank of England, when he actually went to Congress, we have these quotes because they're in the uh, record of Parliament. Although they got burned, but there are copies of it. <coughs> Other people had it. So in 1751, the uh, Bank of England got Parliament to impose restrictions on the issuance of colonial scrip, and then in 1763 they out they banned colonial scrip altogether. It became illegal tender, and all taxes could only be paid in coin. And of course, there wasn't enough coin, so poverty and unemployment began to plague the colonies just as it had in England because the operating medium, or the currency, had been cut in half, and there was insufficient quantities of money to pay for goods and work. And this was the cause of the Revolutionary War. As Benjamin Franklin said, and you might know this quote, the colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been the poverty caused by <coughs> the bad influence of the English bankers on the Parliament, which has caused in the colonies hatred, to, hatred of England and the Revolutionary War. So the first thing that the Continental Congress did was issue the Continental. And what did the British do? They counterfeited it. The Continental was absolutely a brilliant way of issuing a currency so that the colonies felt united. It wasn't colonial strip anymore. It was the, the Continental, which was the currency of the United Colonies. And the British, when they found the printing press in a sunken uh, ship uh, off the coast of New York, um, the British counterfeited eight times the amount of colonial script that the, that the Continental Congress had authorized. And so when it came time to... Uh, write the Constitution, the clause in the Constitution says that the Congress has the right to coin money. To, and, the, and the idea was that if you 
if you uh, coin money and you lose some paper money, it's much more uh, reliable. So it's all about gold and silver. And then you have the, the Silver Act of uh, the Monetary Act of 1792, which allows you to bring your silver to the mint. And the mint would coin it. So you bring the silver, which is worth, say, $10, and the mint coins it, turns it into official currency, and it's now worth $20. And that's how the whole, uh, that system worked for a really long time um, until uh, Andrew Jackson got rid of the bank, uh, Andrew Jackson got rid of the bank, and uh, we had the gold rush, and the whole Western expansion was based on the fact that there was enough money. There was enough money circulating for this incredible uh, growth in the American economy. And then Lincoln issued greenbacks, which was just government fiat money to pay for the war, to pay for the purposes of government. And that, I mean, America has a tremendous history of, of monetary experimentation. And if you look at the history, you can see that money is never valuable in itself. It's always what the lawgiver says it is, and it's always to serve the purpose of there being enough money for all the transactions that the people want to make. Well, we have the opportunity to change that. This article that I'm working on right now will be uh, up on Veterans Today shortly. I've just got a few Good. more, few more uh, paragraphs to finish, and it wasn't, uh, you know, we have the answers, folks, and we've had the answers for a hundred years, but because they control the press, because the bankers <laughs> control the press, you just weren't told about it. I said, you know, we may have been in Armageddon for the last hundred years, and the press just didn't tell us about it. Right. Now, listen, you got a couple of minutes left here. Tell them about your service, our credit, our credit. I've yeah, got it linked up on the site. And uh, tell us about that, John. What we're, well, what we're doing is um, making it really clear that money is an accounting system. So we set up in, in software on the web, access with the smartphone, and an accounting system. And we issue our credits to people as an incentive to use the system. So anything that you buy, you get a 10% rebate. Anything you can sell, you get a 10% rebate, which we just create. Once we've gotten enough people involved in doing it, and we're just at the very early stages of doing it, we have the software developed so you can actually use your R card which has QR code, which is red, and that links the links into your account. We also have an arrangement with an alternative payment system called Dwala, so that we can convert our credits to dollars and dollars to our credits. So if you want uh, more our credits so that you can get the, the bonus and the discount, then you uh, buy our credits or you trade our credits, I mean dollars, for our credits. Once we've gotten to a place where enough people are using it and there's enough circulation, then we all sit down together, and this is the key to the whole thing, we sit down together and we ask each other, what should we issue our credits for? You know, what, what do we want to accomplish? And depending on how we, how we do with that, you know, we might decide to increase the incentive, or we might decide to raise the minimum wage, or we might decide to okay. do any number of things. All right, and we're out of time way. here. We're out of time here. And, folks, if you go to shop.freeamerican, I urge you to uh, get copies of the Free American that are already done, because the 15th will blow the door off of the uh, January 15th issue We'll blow the door off of Wolf Spirit Radio and uh, David Corso, and it will also feature this whole story of Operation Noah's Ark. God bless you, John. Okay. Thank you. I hope to have you back okay. soon, very soon. Okay. Our credit's not All right, sir. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Okay, now. thank you, Clay. Bye-bye.